All right, former great Dolphins coach Mike Westhoff visited the Dolphins' recent OTAs, and he, he made some observations, comments, thoughts that kind of shook a lot of people one way or the other, saying that the offensive practice was a complete disaster. I want to cover that, get into it, and kind of go over what Westhoff said, put a framework around it, not to say that he's an idiot or he's totally right. I did not see what Mike Westhoff saw. And there's certain things that weren't brought up to create context. And I'm going to talk about those. And then at the end, I'm going to do a very deep analytical study on a certain portion of his statements to kind of show that we got to wait to see. Now, I want to thank uh, TD Finn's talk. I'm real, real busy. I don't get to watch a lot of shows. I kind of choosy with what I watch. Don't really like the deal in the drama stuff. I'm really more just about the football side of things, the practical side of things. <laughs> I said in my last co- uh, podcast and some comments that I'm tired of the drama. Dolphins have been a soap opera for so long because they've sucked on the field. And I'm tired of it. Last year, I got burnt out trying to cover it all. He said, she said, 10,000 things. It's, you know, it's ridiculous. So this season, I'm really trying to stay hardcore on film, football analytics, and facts. So I shy away from a lot of the talk stuff because there's a lot of, like, Twitter stuff that I don't follow. But TD Finn Talk, I, I really like him. And this one was him just playing uh, Mike Westhoff's comments and then going over, and I thought he did a real good job. Some things I think he might have left out, or I disagreed, or whatever. But I was really grateful because I would have this whole story would have passed by me because I really don't pay attention to the stuff. The only reason I paid attention to the Tua Twitter warrior thing he did a podcast on because it was on the front page of NFLnews.com for so many days that I figured, you know, I'd answer it. And there's this whole way of McDaniel running the show that's different, and I followed that trail. Anyway, Mike Westoff was one of my favorite coaches growing up as a Dolphins fan. Loved the guy. He was a great coach. A great, great coach. He he did so much for this franchise in his time here. Some people say he's outspoken, they don't like him or whatever. When he was here, he was beloved. Uh, At least I did. I loved the guy. So a lot of fans I see in some of the comments are like, he's a jerk, he's an idiot, he doesn't want to talk about it. That's not fair. This is a guy that helped build this franchise and did a lot for it. Sometimes I feel like Finn fans, they just cut people off as soon as they disagree with them after they're no longer useful. I I wish we would stop doing that. Now, it's not to say Mike Westhoff is totally 100% correct and his word is gospel, because I don't think it is. I think there's some things that I have questions on or disagree. Remember, he's a person. He has biases. He has uh, uh, um, things that he might be wrong about. But overall, this guy knows more about football than all of us combined, and we have to add, we have to say that there is something to what he said. How much does this mean in the long run? We'll see. Okay, so not one rep is worth us. I also see Dolphin fans saying, ah, it's only OTAs. Yes and no. Football, especially now with the limited practices, every time these guys get together, it's critical to win. It's always about being your best and winning, and everything is valuable. Now, at this stage, it's far less valuable than going forward. Practices during the week, going into the playoffs, far more valuable than practices in OTA. But to say it's not valuable at all is wrong. But then to say, well, this is we're going to suck come the season, it's all over, that's a little ridiculous too. But from by all accounts, from many reporters, we struggled offensively. In OTAs, and this was a period of time that we did not win. Totally can change. We need cooperation. So we have these reports about OTAs. We got to wait for training camp and then preseason. And we got those three data points, and then we can start really making statements where we put our foot into the ground. So it's it matters, but let's not write checks of the end-all, be-all for this. Let's see what the growth is come training camp. And then 
preseason games. But it's very important because something is coming up from what Mike Westoff said, and it's rooted in reality. It's just we don't know what the ultimate value is going to be. Now, he said uh, he prefers reactionary coaching, to be honest. He's not been in favor of the way McDaniel's positive with everything. But look, P. Carroll won a Super Bowl, had success. Uh, Bill Belichick, totally opposite end, he's had success. Strategies are not perfect. There's no one size fits all. Okay, and that's, we have to understand that. Let's see how McDaniel handles things going forward. I'm not personally in favor of it, but I'm not personally in favor of the Bill Belichick style. I kind of like Jimmy Johnson style where there was this fuzziness. If you were an elite play, you got special treatment. You could say whatever you want, do whatever you want. It was all okay. It was all good. And then the rest of the 90% of the, the groups of the players, they were under like the Bill Belichick authoritarian style. That's the way I like it. That's just my personality. Okay. So we have to see how it plays out now. He said it was a terrible example of offensive football. He just shut off the music and stopped it. Little, thing, little things were out of whack, not lining up properly, not breaking a huddle and getting up to the line of scrimmage. Uh, how many um, passes com were completed downfield? Overall, talent was good. Wide receiver, D. Very speedy uh, offense. The punter and kicker. Don't practice something you don't have the opportunity to execute. More efficiency. He wanted to see how the quarterback was progressing, and he focused on that. But this is where I start diverging from his final narrative, and even some of TD's final narrative. Some I agree, and some I don't. And again, I could be totally wrong, or I have slices. It's not about that. It's offering perspectives, okay? That's what I'm trying to do here. When the film comes, I'll put my foot in the ground. But at this point, I didn't see anything. I'm just dealing with perspectives, and my questions and how they relate. Um, now, he said they were talking about McDaniel gassing up too and saying he's doing all good. And then uh, he was saying, I don't want to throw anybody under the bus, speaking about McDaniel. But through the process, he kind of was throwing Tua under the bus, saying he was in charge. It was his fault. He wanted to see how the quarterback was progressing and all this stuff kind of, he kept focusing on the quarterback. Now, to an extent, I agree, but this is where I'm starting to diverge from Mike uh, Westoff's narrative. Okay, and in a very good quote, he said, "Not um, being real is not being unpositive. And that's what I want to say to those who might disagree or to, to Mike Westoff or whoever. This is my take. I'm trying to be real as I personally see it. But this is not me being negative to anybody. Because ultimately, Tua could prove to not be the quarterback for the Dolphins. A lot of the people who say Tua's not the guy could prove to be right. And this could be because he's just not good enough or he's totally not good enough. Okay? So, but in the same token, Tua could end up being the quarterback and just be good enough or be way more than what's good enough. We've got to see. And some of these narratives are not based in reality, Westoff, his whole concept was the things weren't being real from a coaching perspective and breaking the huddle, getting to the low LOS, getting set right and passing the football. All these things weren't there and the offense looked terrible. The whole practice seemed off. He needs to start with the staff. Tua has culpability, but let's be clear. Two has got a lot of critiques to him, but getting the team to the line of scrimmage and, and leading offense, he's been doing that since college. And it's never been a major problem. You could say, oh, well, maybe his arm isn't good enough. He gets injured a lot. Maybe when there's pressure, his mechanics break down. These are things that are noted and they're discussion. You're able to discuss these things. But to say that two is just incapable of getting the team to the line of scrimmage, that's a little bit out of whack. Because you have to remember, and I'm going to get into this context too, Armstead's a new left tackle. Eichenberg is starting off at left guard. Connor Williams is now center starting off. And then you have Jackson on the right side. You have Hill coming in, Wilson coming in. The only real guys that he's used to throwing to is Preston, 
Gasecki and Waddle. Now, if he was saying he was overthrowing Waddle, he couldn't connect with Waddle, to me, that has a different level of context and, and gravitas than if he's missing with some of these other receivers he's not used to. If they were getting to the line of scrimmage and it was just him missing, then you could drill down on that. But when guys can't get to the line of scrimmage, they can't break from – anybody who's been in a huddle knows – you're in a huddle. You're saying to play. Guys a little get uncertain. Things are happening. It's not all about the quarterback, especially not getting set right and getting to the line of scrimmage. With all these pieces, a new head coach, a new terminology, a new playbook, there is going to be this stuttering. Now, this has the, the, the primary focus needs to be on a head coach. It's his job to run the to uh, practice efficiently, to get things organized, to have guys ready, to have the people put in that he needs to get this stuff to happen. There was more going on as far as failure than Tua. Now, we need to see who he was missing the passes to. How is he missing the passes? But I want to get into the narrative about Tua's arm. I'm going to show you some bell curves that are graphics and some stats to show you that the overblown nature of Tua's arm is not supported by documented fact. Again, it's not to say he's got a great arm. It's not. It's does he have enough, and what does he compare to to other successful quarterbacks? I'm going to get into that part in just a second. Now, Another bit of context I would like to know is, was this happening with Teddy Bridgewater? They had to have other quarterbacks in there breaking the huddle, getting to the line of scrimmage, and throwing passes. What was, I didn't get, I only heard what TD put on his show. I tried to find the podcast to get a whole thing. I couldn't. This is what I heard. Didn't hear it in his podcast. But specific questions by, uh, I think it was Joe Rose, would have really helped us out a lot. Because if Teddy's getting to the line of scrimmage and everything's running hunky-dory and he's connecting deep and the whole practice feels better with him, then you could really start drawing a line in the sand saying, two needs to get his act together. But we don't have that. We didn't get that information, or at least I couldn't find that information. If you guys do, please let me know. It'd be important. So you have receivers... Fast receivers, you got to get your timing down. Now, I can see him missing. But again, this whole offensive line, guy's not getting set. This is, this is not all about Tua. Neither does it excuse him. But what it does is say that McDaniel, who's a rookie head coach, again, you have a rookie head coach, you have all these pieces coming together on the offense with a notoriously difficult unit to pull together. Remember when Flores came in, he had O'Shea, but he had Fitzpatrick. And he really did have more veterans in the group. And we weren't really under the microscope of the offense going into the season. So we weren't really analyzing the offense like it is now. It's critical for these guys to make a big step come training camp. But at this stage, I need more details. So I want to show these two little graphics from Sharp uh, Football Analysis. They're, it's a great um, site to go to, and you can really check a lot of data. I want to put up right here Tua and his Passing stats is a completion bell curve. I believe it's called it to, uh, from depth. And now here is Tom Brady. Look at the difference of Tom Brady and Tua, their completion percentage, the green line, how Brady's drops off at 30 yards compared to Tua. This is completed passes. All right, so... Tom Brady, we all know, is a great quarterback. He was this close going to another Super Bowl. But you could see over 30 yards, he struggled tremendously. Okay? And Tua 
was better on completed passes. So I want to get into a little of some more analysis to show you this guy has enough arm. Okay, this concept that he can't throw deep, he doesn't, he's not some of these other big arm quarterbacks. Don't get me wrong. If you look at the bell curve of Josh Allen, when you start getting 30 yards, it goes off the charts. He struggles, though, in, you know, uh, 0-15 to 15 compared to Tua. Tua has the edge on 0-15, to 15, but then Josh Allen at like 25, 30 yards just goes off the charts. We understand that. He's got a huge arm, different kind of quarterback. But Tom Brady was almost on the verge of a Super Bowl, and you could see his bell chart from 30 yards or more was drastically worse. But now I want to dial into some more of these stats. Intended air yards. Okay? Intended air yards is you threw the pass, it was completed, it was not completed. Now, Brady was 8.1. Okay? But his completed pass yards, depth of pass, was only 5.7. Tua, his intended air yards, was a lowly 7. But his completed air yards was 5.5. Mahomes, intended air yards, 7.3. Only 0.3 more than Tua. And his completed air yards, 4.9 less than Tua. Okay? So, remember, Brady had 719 attempts, 75 20-plus yard pass plays, 10 plus 40 yard pass plays. Two only had 388 attempts, 30 20 yard pass plays, and six 40 yard pass plays. Mahomes, he had 658 attempts, 58 20 plus yard pass plays, 11 40 yard pass plays. Okay, these are the attempts. But now, move that aside. You see that there. Two or through dra- dra- uh, dramatically less amount of passes, but if you double it up and you hit it, he's in the same ballpark as attempted passes. Okay? And you could see that his completed deep passes were far better than Brady, even though there was a lot less. Okay? Now, over completion percentage is the you, is NFL saying that. The average quarterback having this situation would complete this, and this quarterback, this stat, will tell you whether they exceeded it or or they went below it, okay? So, Tom Brady was minus 1%. And over 700 pass plays, that's a big deal. Tua, 0.9. Just about 100% better than Brady. And Mahomes, the great Mahomes, minus 2.1%. 2.1%. Now, one last comparison here. Josh Allen, the great, super strong, super armed Josh Allen. Let's look at this one. He had 646 pass attempts, and he had 51 20 yard plus plays, 16 30 yard plus plays. Eight 40 yard plus uh, pass plays and three 50 plus yard pass plays. Tua, conversely, had 388 attempts, 30 20 plus yard pass plays, 11 30 yard plus pass plays, six 40 yard plus pass plays, and three 50 yard plus pass plays. So if you extrapolated it out, he would have actually surpassed Allen in deep pass throws. Obviously, Tua wasn't 0% like Brady was for some of his deep pass plays. And it was less than Josh Allen, but it was still successful. So, this shows that Tua, when you give him a certain amount of passes, he's going to be in the general ballpark of these other players as far as attempts. And we could see, I could do more studies, but he surpassed Brady as far as completed 
long pass plays. This does not mean he's awesome. He's got a cannon for an arm. He's being held back. I've gone through it. His mechanics determine his velocity. His velocity lacks at times. His location lacks at times when his mechanics break down. This is something that's been uh, a critique on him since college, since his injuries, really. When you look at his mechanics and his platforms prior to injury, his velocity, his ability to throw deep was much better. Still, it was a little short at times. And no one would ever say he had a great arm. But it was totally different till the injuries. And then his mechanics kind of started to break down. If you look at Drew Brees, who's a great comp for him, Drew Brees had some of the most immaculate mechanics you'd ever see. This guy, he turned his passing game around by be, just having meticulous and immaculate mechanics. And for me, I would be really a lot more concerned for Tua if he had immaculate mechanics and the ball wasn't coming out right. We still need to see this guy grow in his mechanics. Kenny, I don't know. When you round it all out, this hyperbole of concern, and I agree with McDaniel on this, that the kid's got enough arm. You don't live on deep passes. It's not how the game is won. I also agree, though, with Mike Westhoff that you need better. Mike McDaniel is the leader. This was an efficient OTA period. He's got time to rethink, to reorder his, his practice habits, his practice hygiene, and get it together come training camp. If we see something similar to this, the lack of efficiency, the lack of offense, the, the, the you know, just fuzziness, the, the lack of sharpness, then we begin to worry. But this guy, it's his first OTAs as a coach. And Mike Westhoff needed to focus on that first. Because all things flow from leadership. Everything. And when you have an entire offensive unit and your new head coach is the head of that offensive unit and he's a rookie and it's his first time and you have this fuzziness, first order of business is not even to talk about the coach as far as how he feels or says things, but how he organizes the practices and how he runs them. Then you'd want to say how he critiques it. And then you would get to the players. That should be the flow chart of responsibility. I felt like Mike uh, Westhoff was more focused on Tua. There's a time for that. There is a time for that. But right now, it should be about Mike McDaniel coming in sharper, come training camp, and then when we have many eyes on these things and many reports and we get to see for ourselves and we have these two data points, then those correlations can make something happen. But I don't fear the kid's arm or ability to throw deep enough. Not yet. Anyway, this is Curtis saying thanks for staying to the end. Uh, please like, comment, and subscribe. Comments mean the most. Subscribes and likes help us with the Google overlords. Uh, keeps me in business. My sponsor, who pays me and gets me to do this. Somebody had said, you know, oh, these other shows don't have sponsors. I don't know. I, I couldn't make $20 a video <laughs> and put in five hours a day. And I got kids in the house and all kinds of stuff. So I need a sponsor in order to do this. So you guys, for your views, your comments, subscriptions, the likes, the whole thing, I'm really grateful because they've been happy so far with what's been going on. And that's thanks to you. I want to, I was going to do a little thing here uh, at the end about a mea culpa on my last video, but I'll save that for next time. I got some other things I want to talk about, but I'll do that for the next one. This went on kind of long enough. So anyway, this is Curtis saying thanks. Catch you next time. Go Fins and see you soon. Bookies can earn hundreds to thousands of dollars from booking action with aceperhead.com.